Um, my name is Diane. I am actually from Eden Autism Services, which is located in Princeton, New Jersey. Eden provides services for individuals with autism through the lifespan. So pretty much from the earliest possible start um, through adulthood, we actually provide services. I've worked in our agency for 26 years now, and I've worked with every age group across that population, and my passion is infants and toddlers and early intervention. I think that's the place where we need to start with our little guys and really give them that first real good start. Um, there's a lot of differences across the nation I know with early intervention and how those services are distributed and how the federal government actually distributes them to families and how families can access it. Hopefully today we can talk about the early signs, the early at-risk factors that we need and how we can put together comprehensive and effective programs for these young children. Of course, you all know why you're here. Autism is a brain disorder. It significantly impairs the assimilation of information, causing problems in social behavior, communication, and learning. And our babies, very early on, this is what's going on. They're not able to process that information, which significantly impacts their ability to engage with their caregivers, with their families, and the ability for them to take in the information they need to learn and go through developmental milestones. Currently, the last number that I heard for um, prevalence of autism, um, the Centers for Disease Control this year stated that one in 110 children has an autism spectrum disorder and about one in eight has a developmental disability. Studies are now showing that about a third of the parents noticed a problem before a child's first birthday and 80% saw problems by 24 months. So very early on, parents are noticing that there's differences in their children. Many times it may be that there's a sibling in the family and they're saying something's not quite right. Um, some pediatricians, some doctors are very open to saying, you know, this may be an issue, you need some additional information. And some doctors are a little bit more, well, let's wait and see what happens. He's young, there's variability. But my advice, if your parents, professionals, Get those kids checked out. Look at the at-risk factors that we're seeing, and let's see if we can provide that intervention very early on before three years of age comes. Um, if you saw Dr. Klin this morning, he talked about that right now in the United States, the median age for diagnosis is four years, five months. Much, much too late. Um, the pathways and the neuroplasticity with kids under three is incredible, and their outcomes are going to be dramatically different if we catch them very early on. The first part of the um, workshop I'd like to share with you, just some early signs and symptoms of autism that we can see very early on. And again, you have to be very astute as a parent, I think, and as a professional, to look at a four-month-old and analyze that they have a lack of relatedness or warmth. These are babies that may not want to cuddle. These are babies that you know, don't have good eye contact. They may look away, but it's very subtle. It's not something that a lot of times is standing right out at you um, because babies are inconsistent. Sometimes they want to be cuddled, sometimes they don't. But at four months of age, if we're seeing a baby that really doesn't want to be held and doesn't give you that reciprocal feedback and hold on to you, there may be something going on. At six months of age, some of our little ones, they're not smiling consistently, and they're not reacting to their parents' presence. So you have that, that lack of that reciprocal smile. You may be trying to engage them, and they're really not responding the way you would expect. Um, again, this morning, and I'm stuck on Dr. Kling because I thought his research is just so incredible, looking at what babies are seeing when people are talking to them. At six months of age, those babies were looking at people's mouths, they were looking at objects, they weren't looking at faces and eyes. And that's remarkable. And I think if pediatricians had his little machine in their office, at six months they could do a screening and say, you know, there's something going on with this little guy, we need some early intervention, we need someone to work with them and stimulate them so that these things don't get worse long term. So six months of age is a critical point. Most of the children that we see that come to us between 9 and 12 months, it's a little bit easier to pick out that something is not developmentally quite right. Um, I'm sure you've all heard joint attention. Joint attention is that joint sharing that babies do very early on. It's that point, duh, and they look up and they look right at you. And they don't want you to get that thing. 
They don't want you to play with that thing. They just want to make sure that you see the same thing they're looking at. That's joint sharing. Happens between 9 and 12 months, very, very early on. Our children that are at risk are really not doing joint attention. We see a lack of babbling. Um, some of our little ones aren't able to babble. They're not engaging in baby talk, and it may be extremely delayed. We may hear some cooing and maybe some vocal sounds, but we're not getting that true babbling that we hear very early on in babies. Gesturing. Um, if you have children, if you've seen children very early on, babies are pointing at things, they're looking at you, they really want to let you know what's in their environment, and they're using those gestures very effectively. Our little ones are not yet using gestures, and they're not waving bye-bye. Real big factor. If you have to really imitate and push your child to say bye-bye, there's something not processing, that social engagement piece is not there. And then, of course, still, we're looking for that reciprocal smile. If I smile at my baby and I make faces, I'm going to expect some kind of response. If I'm not getting that response, that means that something's delayed socially. <clears throat> at 12 to 14 months, we typically see single words emerging by about 16 months of age. So that first word, it is variable, of course, but you expect to start seeing those first words coming out. Sometimes it's mama, sometimes it's dada, sometimes it's just a simple word like shoe. But babies are starting to make that, that connection that a, an object has a name and it has a word. Um, problem solving is difficult for our little guys. Um, they may take toys out, empty out the toys, but not sure how to do and finish completion of the play. They're not able to solve those problems, not able to maneuver their environment appropriately, so they're starting to struggle a little bit at that 12 to 14 months. And another big one, when families come to us, they say to me, well, he doesn't respond to his name. Is it that he can't hear us, or is he not able to process that that's actually his name? Or is it that lack of engagement? So I think there's many factors going on with that early 12 to 14 month stage where we're looking at those early types of processing of language that the kids are not able to do. Um, 18 months of age usually is a big marker for diagnosis. I think that's when families and parents really look at their little ones and say, wow, you know, 18 months, he should be doing a lot more than he is. And that's the time that really I think pediatricians start you know, looking forward and saying, do we need to see a developmental pediatrician? But motor gestures are very, very delayed. Motor gestures meaning pointing, pushing away, waving bye-bye, um, any kind of pointing, joint attention. All these motor gestures, kids aren't using them effectively to communicate. Pretend play starts to come into play at 18 months. So if our little ones really aren't playing with cause and effect toys yet, and they're not playing just generally with manipulatives, we're not going to see those early pretend play skills. Language also emerges for social interaction at 18 months, and we also see a delay in that area, and the subtle eye gaze. And again, this is all about engagement and social behaviors, so babies will look over, and they'll try to engage you with their eye contact, and they're real sweet, and we see a lack of that in our little ones that are at risk or are showing those early signs of autism. At 24 months, we do see a lack of imaginative play, and there's no meaningful two-word phrases. 24 months is really when children start putting two words together. So if we look back at all the other signs, if we're not doing single words, we're not doing gestures, we're really not engaging in appropriate pretend or imaginary play, we're really not going to be seeing those two-word phrases coming into play. And you can have one two or several of these behaviors all associated, not just one is going to mean that you're at risk for autism. But these are just some different samples of things that people will see in these early years. And then at 36 months, hopefully kids are already identified, but at 36 months, kids aren't able to verbalize their emotions. Three-year-olds are very, very intent on telling you they're not happy, they're sad, they're angry, and they can communicate that to us. Um, if we're not developing language and we aren't developing appropriate social behaviors, we're not going to be able to talk about our emotions. We also start to see difficulty interacting with peers, so they're not playing with small groups. And granted, three-year-olds aren't the best sharers. 
Um, they don't really play that well together anyway, but there are those connections that three-year-olds are starting to make on the playground, and they are interested in what their peers are doing. They're beginning to model their peers' behavior. Um, pretend play again, and then little or no communication repair, meaning that they're not able to go into a situation and communicate with a peer or a caregiver, and if they're not understood, be able to correct that and be able to use another way to communicate their need or their want. Okay, so you're looking at kids that receptively and expressively are not able to use language effectively for communication and especially for social interaction. And I think under the age of three, those, those are the key areas that we're looking for. We're looking for that social piece. Any questions? I'll be open. So. Um, some of our other early indicators abnormalities in initiating communication with others. Rather than asking for help with something, our children may struggle alone without looking for assistance. And I don't know how many times a mom has told me, oh, he doesn't tell me what he wants. He just goes over to the counter, he climbs up, and he gets the cookies all by himself. He's very independent. Okay? Well, that's great, but another typically developing child may actually ask for help. They may want somebody to come over and help them, where it's too hard for our little guys, so they do it on their own. They have an inner ability to initiate and respond to opportunities to share experiences. So they may not follow your gaze. If you're outside, Johnny, look, see that big bird? They may not be able to look up and point to the bird and share that experience with you. And these are real subtle behaviors, I think, that we see. And you could mistake it for, well, you know, he just really doesn't want to do that with me. Or he really doesn't want to communicate with me right now. You know, he's having a bad day. Um, irregularities when playing with toys. So instead of using a toy as it's meant to be used, they may use it in an inappropriate way. So for example, if I pick up a toy fork, I'm going to pretend to eat with the fork because I know what a fork is and it's a pretend to play motion. Child that um, is at risk for autism may do something different with it, may use it to dig in the dirt, um, may use it to flip or stem on. Okay, so they're not using objects in the ways that they're intended to use it. And there's a significantly reduced variety of sounds, words, and gestures for communication. Um, compared with typically developing children, children with autism have a much smaller inventory of words and gestures that they use to communicate with others. And what we need to do is teach them how to communicate effectively. We need very early on to help them develop gestures so that they don't get frustrated and they are able to develop those skills. Um, as an early intervention provider, early intervention throughout the state, as I said, does vary. Um, but for eligibility, typically there will be an assessment that'll, that will assess developmental levels and let parents know, okay, Johnny is 25% delayed in one area. Um, he has a delay in motor skills. But what we really want to look at is what are the social behaviors that these little guys are demonstrating that put them at risk for a later diagnosis of autism? And how can we, in early intervention, actually help parents understand why those behaviors are significant and how we can address those behaviors through the EI system? Um, the first one, the Ages and Stages Questionnaire, is a screener, um, looks at developmental developmentally developed, I can't talk, developmental milestones, but it also is a quick way for families to go through and talk about behaviors that their child does at home. If you're familiar with um, Barry Prasant and Amy Weatherby, I know Dr. Klin mentioned them this morning, the Communication Symbolic Behavior Scales checklist also really focuses on communication and social language in children under 24 months. So we're looking at how children are using um, gestures and their language to communicate, how they're using those communicative behaviors to function in their environment. A really, really good checklist to give you that additional information on social development. Um, a lot of the standardized measures that we use to assess developmental levels in children don't give us a real clear picture of social relatedness. And I think that's a big challenge, finding a social assessment scale that will really look at young children for us. <clears throat> Another um, 
scale that I use that I find very, very helpful is the Vineland Social Emotional Early Childhood Scales. And this set of scales is actually for children zero to five and again looks at social behaviors. It kind of sets aside from the communication. It really doesn't look at motor behaviors. It's specifically on how children interact socially with their caregivers and their family members. The screening tool or the STAT for autism in toddlers and young children, you can actually screen kids at one year. And it looks at a very specific set of behaviors that would put a child at risk. And I have the next slide, I'll kind of go through some of those critical behaviors that we see, um, but the STAT is appropriate for children at age one. And then the last two, the checklist for autism in toddlers, the CHAT, which was originally um, developed by Simon Baron Cohen in London, and then recently, um, Debbie Fine out of, I believe it's University of Connecticut, um, the modified checklist for autism in toddlers, which we use extensively in our program. When we have a young child come in for the first time, we will use the MCHAT to screen the child to see what behaviors the families are concerned about and what behaviors really are showing that that child has some significant needs. And this is a list of the critical behaviors that they list on the MCHAT. It's actually a list of about 23 different items, 23 different behaviors that we look at. These are the behaviors that actually are the critical ones, or if your child fails two of these areas, it means that they will most likely or probably have a diagnosis of autism at some point developmentally. So the first is, does your child take an interest in other children? Not do they go out and play with them, are they engaged with other kids, but are they interested in watching other kids? And this is sometimes a hard question for families because, well, of course my child's interested in other children. He watches them all the time. But it's more that qualitative difference. Is your child going to sit and watch another child play and then maybe, maybe model it? Um, does your child use his index finger to point to ask for something? Gestures are critical. Um, that first time a baby points to something. I know as a mom, I jumped across the room and got whatever he was pointing at. Oh, yeah, I see it. You know, that's great. Look at that. But if the child doesn't start pointing, that interaction is, is, um, is impaired. So the, they don't have that reciprocal back and forth. So using a point, um, using an index finger to indicate interest in something. Again, joint attention or joint sharing is one of those critical behaviors that we're looking at in the MCHAT. Does your child bring you something to show you? And that's your typical, look, mommy, you know, I did this, or just showing you a ball. The child shows it to you, and then they take it back. Very, very different than bringing a book to mom and wanting mom to read it. So again, it's a qualitative difference. You're talking about showing something, not requesting for help, not requesting for an action, but just simply showing you and sharing you something. Imitation. Does your child imitate you? Um, critical behavior, foundational behavior for learning. We need to teach children how to imitate very, very early on in order for them to develop skills. If a child is not able to imitate or model behavior, we have a huge, huge issue. Um, it's not a skill that we can wait to teach. We have to teach it immediately because everything you learn is based upon modeling others' behavior, especially in these very, very early years Kids watch their siblings. Um, they watch kids on the playground. They watch their parents. And in this day and age, we all watch TV. So they see things that they're learning about, and they need to understand how to process that, that say and do or the do this, which is so critical. Again, does your child respond to his name is one of those behaviors. And if you point at a toy across the room, does the child look at it? So is the child engaged enough with you to be able to look across the room when you say, look, see the ball? Are they able to engage with you in that way? If your child fails or the child fails two or more of these behaviors, they need to have follow-up with a neurodevelopmental pediatrician or a neurologist. So if you are an early intervention practitioner, I guess I should have asked beforehand who actually works in the EI world. Um, this is a real nice way to look at those behaviors and help families make decisions on where they need to go next. Um, I know in New Jersey, they caution practitioners not to tell families if a child is really showing 
signs of autism. We're not diagnosticians, but I think we do owe it to families to let them know if something is not quite right developmentally and then be able to guide them to get the appropriate services that they do need. Some learning characteristics. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm sure a lot of you um, have seen children on the spectrum and have an idea of what the learning characteristics and their educational needs are, especially very, very young. This does go through the lifespan. So some, excuse me, some children will actually have these learning difficulties and challenges throughout their life. So if we can start addressing them very early on, hopefully we can make some impact and get those pathways moving so that they're not as impaired as we move forward. So there's very little learning through incidental teaching, meaning that a lot of little ones, I think it's amazing that when you have a young child, they learn things just because they're awake. Um, they come up with their first word. Nobody taught them their first word. Okay? Nobody taught them to point to the cookie to ask for it. Okay, they just kind of figure that out by watching other people. So that's incidental learning. Something happens one time, they do it again. If I, you know, if I make a funny face and mommy laughs, I'm going to do it again. That's incidental teaching. Um, many of our little ones aren't able to learn that way. They, don't, they have to be shown how to do it in order to move on to that next step. Um, I had a mom come in with me last week, and her little guy was two, and he's not pointing yet. And um, I said, well, that is an indicator that something's up. And she said, well, I didn't, never taught him to point. And I'm like, you're not supposed to. You don't have to teach your child to point. You don't have to teach your child to say bye-bye. So very important, that incidental teaching piece. Um, language comprehension issues. A lot of our little ones have a significant language processing difficulty. Um, so we tell families, reduce your language. Don't give a lot of instruction. I mean, I'm talking a lot. Um, and if a, nut, if a small child were listening to me, they probably would be confused because they can't take all that information in at one time. They need small, structured, short sentences and phrases. Instructions need to be marked down so that they can truly understand it. Um, children need to be in your face so that they know that when you say, come here, that they're able to understand and you know that they've heard you say it. Um, discrete trial instruction is a great way early on to do language comprehension training, um, receptive object identification, and following directions. It's very, very important for learning readiness that our kids understand simple directions very, very early on. And if we can give them that constant um, repetition and give them those instructions over and over again, and everybody has the same response, you're going to have a much better effect rather than bombarding them with a lot of different information. Imitation, I'm going to go back to imitation because it's my soapbox. We have to teach imitation. Um, we can do it discreetly through mass trials. We can do it just incidentally. But children need to understand what do this means. So it could be simple gross motor imitation. It can be play imitation, however you want to teach it. But do this needs to be in your vocabulary when you're working with very, very young children because that's the foundation for everything else that we're going to be able to teach them as we move forward. Um, abstract language is very, very difficult. Understanding that abstraction um, and being able to break down abstract concepts for um, our individuals. We um, have a little girl, and um, she just started playing soccer. And the coach had said to all the kids, I want you all to put your eyes on me. And she got up, and she went over, and she put her eyes on him because she didn't understand that that was, you know, a cliche. It was just an abstract concept or an, on, an, an abstract statement that he made. She was more that concrete. You want me to put your eyes on you? Okay, I'll do it. <clears throat> um, motivation for learning. If there's not motivation and there's not reinforcement available and present, it's going to be very difficult to teach skills to young children. What's the payoff? Why do I want to do it? Um, and I think we need to really look at what motivates each child. It's going to be very, very different um, across the board. Sometimes it's bubbles. Sometimes it's walking away. Sometimes it's it could be anything. It's, very rarely is it food, but um, many times it's something in their environment that they love. And in order for us to make sure that skills are going to develop and they're going to be maintained, 
we need to be very creative and figure out what those motivational things are for young children. Um, I know Kathy was talking about, I don't know if you were here for Kathy Pratt's discussion, she was talking about um, reinforcement, and what's reinforcing to me may not be reinforcing to anybody else. And the time of day and what the, the child's situation is may actually either decrease or increase the um, probability that something will be reinforcing. Many of our young kids will also have splinter skills. At the end of the presentation, I actually have a small clip of a young man who um, was obsessed with letters. Many of our little ones um, love letters and numbers, and I'm not sure where that comes from, but they you know, aren't able to say single words but can count up to 20. If I bring out a letter puzzle, it's like so highly motivating that for some reason this is something that they enjoy. Um, we had one little boy who could actually read at two and a half and he was very motivated by that, and anything that had to do with the letters and the words were good ways to motivate him to do other behaviors. <clears throat> Poor attending skills, of course, being able to have children sit and attend to activities is um, another area where we need to really address and teach the whole idea of being able to sit and do skills on command. Um, one of the things that I see a lot in early intervention with um, practitioners is if a child won't sit, we put them in their height chair and we strap them into the height chair. Well, that teaches the child that when someone comes to work with me, I have to sit in my height chair, but it doesn't teach them how to sit. And I think that's a critical behavior for young kids. We need to teach them that they need to sit on their bottom, whether it's on the floor, whether it's on a chair. I mean, we can still use a height chair, but not the whole idea of strapping them in ready for action. <clears throat> Difficulty with generalization. Um, again, teaching things in, with multiple exemplars. Um, if you're going to teach a cup, you're going to make sure that you teach 50 different cups so that the child doesn't learn that the green sippy cup with the blue straw is a cup, but that yellow thing over there is, I don't know what that is. So being able to generalize very early on and not teaching things real rote will actually help expand what that child can take forward with them. And then, of course, even in early intervention with children under three, we have challenging behaviors. We do see some children that have some extreme self-stimulatory behaviors. We have some children that will engage in self-injury and aggression. And if we can address that at two years old, I think we're going to have much better outcomes than if we wait until they're six or seven and that behavior has been so ingrained. Um, it's a lot of hard work. I think it's getting parents and family members to really take on board the whole idea of this is something that we need to address now. And you know what? He's going to be upset. He's going to be scared. But it's something that we need to address and work through so that later on that won't be a problem. Because if you think about it, if you have a typically developing two-year-old and they, they want a cookie and you say, no, not now, and that two-year-old lies on the floor, kicks his feet, and has a tantrum, screams and yells. Are you going to give him the cookie? Hopefully not. But it's the same type of thing. If, if, we're, if we're concerned that this child doesn't understand, so we're going to give him the cookie anyway, okay, because maybe they have a processing problem, that behavior that one time is so much more reinforced than all the other times that you said no. So take, just thinking about it before we act and making sure that we're looking at why behaviors are occurring and how we're going to address them, even at a very, very early age. Okay. The um, program that we use or um, the teaching strategies that we use are applied behavior analysis. Um, and ABA, of course, is discipline devoted to understanding improvement of human behavior, and we focus on objectively defined and observable behaviors. And the principle is that behavior that is reinforced is likely to occur again. So in our teaching strategies, we're going to look at behaviors that we want to increase over time. Some reduction, but pretty much when you're working with a baby, we really want to increase a lot of the learning behaviors. We want to teach kids how to attend. We want to look at the whole child and develop a comprehensive set of goals that will help them reach later outcomes. Um, when we, um, I, yeah, I'm sorry, in early intervention, when we are writing um, an 
individual family service plan, we're talking about outcomes and the family needs and what the families want to work on. I think as professionals, we need to kind of look at what are those objectives going to look like and what skills are we going to teach in those sequences to make sure that those behaviors are likely to occur in the future. And when we're looking at applied behavior analysis, we're looking at different teaching strategies and taking these different strategies under the hat of applied behavior analysis and using them in our daily interactions with young kids. Shaping behaviors, um, great way to look at early behaviors that children are showing and shaping them so that they'll occur more frequently. Um, we do a lot of functional analysis of behavior. But these are all things I'm sure that you guys have heard about before. They're the basic strategies in ABA, but what we're going to do is use them to develop an appropriate curriculum. So when we're talking about different skills that we want to teach, we want to use these different strategies to put them into place and use them so that we're able to appropriately reinforce and maintain the behavior. Um, I found with children young with a diagnosis of autism, um, we really want more of a structured type of EI program. We want to have direct intervention. We want to make sure that we are really structuring what they're learning. Um, there's, a, I think, a path in the whole philosophy of early intervention, child-directed versus adult-directed. And with our young children that are having significant issues with processing, we need to really look at doing more adult-directed child choice but definitely more adult directed so that we can get in there and teach these kids. They're not going to do it on their own. And if we're kind of waiting for them to evolve and do the behavior on their own, I think we're wasting precious time. Um, we need to go in there and pick the skills that we want to work on and gradually go through a developmental sequence. So using these different pr principles, um, prompting and prompt fading, using reinforcement, using discrete trial, using chaining behaviors, all of these different strategies are going to help us to develop those appropriate skills in our young children. Okay. This was supposed to be a video, but the video didn't come through. So um, can I just show of hands how many folks actually work in early intervention? Okay, so number of you. And I'm from New Jersey, so I know in New Jersey we have some specific guidelines for kids on the spectrum. And I think Colorado is here today also presenting. Okay, guidelines. <coughs> and I get very frustrated because although there are these guidelines and we want to make sure that we have developmentally appropriate practices and we have effective interventions, I think the biggest struggle that we have in New Jersey is frequency of service. And I just wanted to share that with you a little bit. Um, we've had some families come in and they'll say, oh, Johnny's getting one hour a week of um, special instruction. And I'm like, okay, that's great, but that's not a whole heck of a lot. Or he's getting speech once a month. And I'm like, wow. So I think in, the, in our country in general, when you go to different states, it's all very disjointed on what kids are actually getting. They're all entitled to an evaluation. They're all entitled to a plan but they're not necessarily entitled by the federal government for those specific services. So as professionals and parents, how do we get those services for our young kids? Accessing services can be extremely challenging. Um, the insurance bills. I'm not sure how many states right now have insurance legislation passed, but it's a growing number of states. But now that we have it, how do we access it? Um, the state guidelines are different for every state, and insurance guidelines are different for every single company. I know right now I'm playing the CPT code game, um, that this insurance company accepts 1234, but this company over here accepts H3012, and then this one over here is 98086 for the same service. So I think they're, it's not that they're making it hard, but I think it's very hard as professionals to help families be able to use their insurance appropriately to get the services that they need, especially for kids under three. And also keeping in mind that all these autism insurance legislation pieces, you need to have a diagnosis. 
You need that 299.00 in order to get that kind of service, ABA or whatever, from your insurance company. So you're in this slippery slope where some professionals don't want to diagnose young kids, but really, we need to make sure that we are diagnosing them appropriately so families can access those very, very necessary services. Um, the magic number, the frequency, I think it varies for each individual family and child, but it's certainly not one, and it's certainly not one time a month. Um, New Jersey guidelines anywhere from, you know, five to 20 hours a week of service based upon each individual child's needs. So I think... For school-age children, we have a plan. The kids have a plan. There's going to be services for them, and it's mandated by the government. For early intervention, it's a little bit more sketchy, and it's up to each state to come up with really good guidelines for those services and making sure that those kids are identified and are given what they need. That was my little soapbox. Thank you for listening. Okay, um, next task. Um, which is a national organization, did elements of effective programs for individuals and young children with autism. And again, it's the earliest possible start to intervention. The earliest child we, the youngest child we actually worked with was nine months of age. And no, of course, we didn't do a full 20-hour, full-fledged program, but we started engaging them very early and stimulating some of those areas that we saw were real concerning. Individualization of services for children and for families. One size does not fit all, and especially in early intervention, each family is very, very different in what they can handle, what they're able to do on a daily basis, and what you know, the child can actually handle. Um, I know over the last 10 to 20 years, there's been this you know, thought that, oh, we need to have 30 to 40 hours of service. There's no going back. You need to have that. Some families can't handle that. And some kids are overwhelmed by it. So finding that perfect point and then building from there, I think, is much more effective. And then we can learn about the child and know individually what they're going to need. Systematic and planful teaching. We want to have a plan. We're not just going to go in there with a shape sorter and a ball and sit down and expect the child to respond. We want to have a plan on how we're going to teach each of these skills that the child needs using a specialized curriculum. And right now in New Jersey, what they're doing is creating specialized autism early intervention programs. So programs need to develop a curriculum and then actually apply to be a specialized program, um, which I think is great because it gives families and I think it gives professionals an idea of exactly what you're going to use, how you're going to teach it. You know, what are the different objectives that you're actually going to put together for this child? Intensity of engagement, which I've kind of mentioned, um, looking at what is the correct level of service for our young kids. And I think if you ask anybody, everyone's going to have a different opinion on what that frequency is. We know it needs to be intensive. We know it needs to be frequent. We know that we want families to be trained and able to use the same strategies, because if I'm there an hour a week, that family is with that child 24-7, and they're going to be able to use those strategies effectively and efficiently on a daily basis. So making sure that we have that right frequency and making sure that it's correct for the family. And again, family involvement. We want to be able to use strategies that families can implement on their own. Um, we don't want to do anything fancy, use big words that are meaningless to them. We want them to understand that if Johnny does this, this is what we're asking you to do. If Johnny wants his bottle, we want you to teach him how to point. If you want Johnny to say bye-bye, you're going to imitate it for him and then show him how to do it. So using real easy language, using parent training techniques, providing family support is what's going to help develop these comprehensive programs for our young kids. What we've done um, over the years for um, using ABA, um, when we first started working with very young children, we were a little bit nervous because our only experience was working with children that were school-aged. So when you're using ABA teaching techniques, you know, the traditional 15-year-ago discrete trial in the classroom is you're sitting at a table in a chair and you have a little desk and you're doing trials with kids. And we thought to ourselves, you know what, you can't do that with toddlers. Toddlers don't sit at a chair. 
toddlers don't necessarily sit at a table. So how do we take these ABA strategies that we've used for school-aged children and adults and incorporate them into an appropriate program for infants and toddlers? And I do believe that many professionals do struggle with this, especially, you know, new BCBAs. And, you know, we understand all the teaching techniques and we understand what we want to teach, but looking really at the age of the child and how you're going to be able to use those strategies developmentally appropriately. Um, so the first piece of this is incorporating initiations from the child. So it's not all about being adult-directed. It's about taking in initiations from the child and using them to engage in activities. For example, if um, I have several toys on the floor, and um, Johnny crawls over to the shape sorter, I may pick it up and say, oh, he want to play with the shape sorter. So I'll open it up and we'll start the interaction. When it becomes adult directed is when Johnny starts to crawl away from it. And then I want to bring him back and initiate him and direct him into the activity. So I'm allowing him to make that choice to increase the potential for motivation, but then I'm also going to direct him to follow through with that activity. And then when it's done, we put it away and we move on to the next thing. So you're incorporating every initiation that the child makes. And if the child doesn't initiate, you're going to set up opportunities for that. Um, communication temptations, there, if you go online, there's usually like a list. This is another thing from Barry Prezant and Amy Weatherby. It's a list of activities that you can actually tempt a child to communicate with you. So for example, if I have a bottle of bubbles, I'm going to blow the bubbles a couple times. I'm going to close it up and hand it back to the child. And then I'm going to wait to see how that child's going to communicate to me that they want more. If they're not interested, well, then that's a done deal. But 80% of the time, a child's going to be interested in bubbles. So you kind of prompt them to somehow indicate that they want more. That's teaching engagement. That's actually using a naturally occurring event that's developmentally appropriate to get that child to communicate with you. Um, if you are working on an activity and the child is not responding, using prompting to get them to actually respond and finish the activity. So if I'm working on imitation and I say, Johnny, do this, and he doesn't respond, I'm going to take his hands and I'm going to prompt him and show him how to respond. Very simple prompt, but I'm going to continue to prompt. I'm not just going to wait for him to necessarily do it on his own. I'm going to model it and prompt him and show him how to do it. And of course, reinforcement. If we don't have reinforcement or a way to increase that behavior, those behaviors are not going to be maintained. What is the payoff for me to do it? Okay, And that's going to be different for every child that we work with. Um, some kids are very, very difficult to motivate because they're interested in things other than what we can provide them. Some kids are easy. They love everything. They love pictures. They love candy. They like, you know, looking at things. And those are the kids that are easy. But it's the real, the kids that just shut down and don't want anything. And we have to kind of really figure out what the, what's going to be that motivating piece. And one thing that we have learned over the years, initially when we started doing EI with very young kids, we figured the bottle. The bottle is going to be the reinforcement. If I use that with the kids, it's going to be really easy because they're going to want to work for that bottle. It doesn't work because the bottle is unconditional. Okay, they, they have that. That's their way that they eat, and kids won't work for that. So you have to find things that are really good. Um, incidental teaching we talked about, and then reinforcing all reciprocal responding. So whenever that child responds at you, you're going to give them that big old smile and respond right back to increase those reciprocal interactions. Okay. Um, over the years, we've also developed a curriculum that we're using with our young children. Um, actually, Eden has a series of curriculum, but this specific one, which I'll kind of go through with you just to give you an idea of what the different tasks or what the different goals would be when developing outcomes. Um, you want to make sure that whatever curriculum you're using, it's developmentally appropriate, and it actually has programming in all areas of development. Um, I know many times, especially with early intervention, families are most concerned with communication. They want their children to speak. They want their children to engage with them. But we can't forget about all those other pieces. Um, there are self-care activities that two-year-olds do. Um, 
Play is critical. Language processing. And we can't forget about all these other pieces as we go through and develop programming. So, I don't know if you can see it real well. Um, this is the way that I track actually learning and the learning skills that we're working on. So the first area, learning readiness. Um, and under learning readiness, we're going to be looking at a couple different behaviors. Um, sitting behavior. And we mentioned this before. We need to teach children how to sit. And that means sitting on a floor to do an activity. It means sitting in a child-sized chair. But it's more responding to the idea that if I say sit down, I'm going to somehow give you an activity that's going to engage you in sitting down. Um, I'm not going to work on random trials of stand up, sit down, but I want to teach the child that when I say sit down, there's a reason for it. Okay? So appropriate sitting is one of those very, very early skills that is critical to increase attention. Eye contact. And again, eye contact can be a slippery slope. We want children to be able to use eye gaze and engage us in eye contact. We're not necessarily talking about look at me and giving that, you know, that real rote responding. We want to present materials and toys that are actually going to engage the child and make the child want to look at us so that we can then reinforce that spontaneous eye contact. The more natural pieces we can put in this using our ABA strategies, I think it's more effective for that younger population of kids because it kind of goes with their routine and how they play and how they work. Gross motor imitation is another learning readiness skill that we need in order to develop that foundation. And of course, simple one-step commands. And one of the first one-step commands that we teach is give me, um, which very, very simple, but very, very important. If a child needs help, if you need to take something away, kids need to understand what give me means. Um, other simple commands that are very important come here, especially with little ones, because if they're moving away, they need to know that when mommy says come here, I need to come here. And also, when we're teaching one-step commands, remembering that we give a direction one time, and then we show the child what to do. I still remember when I was five, if I was out playing, my mother would call my name. I knew the third time she called my name, I had to come home. Okay? Well, our kids don't have that ability to go that gray. They need the black and white. Come here. This is what come here means. Okay? So those are like just some basic learning readiness skills. And when I'm working with a family, I'm going to look at those four different goals, and I'm going to pick things that I think are going to be helpful to that family. Okay? Typically, we want to work on all of these things very early on. The next section is cognitive skills. So we're going, to look on, we're going to look at child's cognitive development based on their developmental assessment and pick out goals that would be appropriate for them. Um, auditory perception or being able to respond to sound sources. Um, we want kids to be able to turn their head if they hear a sound, and we're going to practice that. So if a child doesn't necessarily respond to sounds in the environment, that can be, that can be troublesome. So practicing and presenting sounds and then modeling to them or prompting them to turn their head to look at the sound source. Being able to manipulate objects functionally brushing your hair, using a spoon, using a fork. Um, many of our little ones have feeding difficulties, so using utensils can be a real challenge. But being able to teach them how to use these things functionally outside of that feeding session may actually be very, very helpful and help them to learn how to generalize it. Um, another imitation skill that we like to work on is imitating actions with objects which can be simple toys, it can be utensils, but learning how to imitate an action that someone else is presenting with an object. Early cognitive behavior also is matching. Um, some of our children actually very, very young will have some pretty good matching skills. For some reason, those visual skills tend to be strong. Um, so we will teach matching, but we'll start in a hierarchy. I'm not going to start with matching letters and numbers. I'm probably going to start with matching objects, that idea that objects are the same. Object permanence, which the old theory that um, if you don't know an object exists, you can't develop a word. So understanding that if you hide an object, it's not going to disappear. It's still there. Um, so object permanence is a foundational skill for language development. 
It's something that we want to make sure our kids have in their repertoire when we're teaching early language skills. And along with that, visual tracking, being able to look and track objects across the span. Um, and some of these skills you're going to see when you assess a child, they're going to have bits and pieces of it, but making sure you fill in the gaps. And it's like that taco. You have the shell of the taco, and you have to make sure you put all the meat and the cheese and the lettuce inside to make sure it's all together. Um, so you may see different holes, but making sure that you have all these pieces. And then once I have these primary skills done, I go to the secondary level. And these are a little bit harder skills, but matching shapes, more of those preschooly skills that kids have. So as professionals and as parents, kind of deciding, what are the skills that are appropriate for my two-year-old? Okay? I can't skip some of those foundational things because he likes letters. I have to make sure that all those other pieces are taken care of and that they're mastered. Um, for communication, which is different, in my opinion, than expressive language development, for communication, the primary targets that we're looking at is choice making. We want to teach kids to make choices. Not everything is cut and dry. Not everything is black and white. So if I have two things, I want Johnny to be able to choose the toy that he likes, the food that he likes, or the item that he likes. And we'll practice that, that if I give you two things, which one do you want? And then they're naturally reinforced by getting the item that they're choosing. And again, you have to make sure if you give a choice, you're ready to accept the choice, okay? If you don't want them to choose, don't ask. Um, <laughs> communicating basic needs and desires, um, helping our little ones to communicate that they need help is usually the first step. Um, all of our babies need help with something. Even though they may not admit it, they need help with something. So teaching them a way to communicate help, either handing an adult something, um, if it's a sign, using a sign for help, um, but somehow indicating that they need something. And gestural communication. The very first communicative act that we actually teach is gestural communication. We teach pointing. I think it's very, very important that kids learn how to point very early on. In natural language development is one of the first things that kids do communicatively. And before we can go to using sign language, before we can use picture exchange, before we can add any kind of augmentative piece, to their language, we have to make sure that they understand that this point is powerful. And I do see some kids, once they figure it out, it's like, wow, you know, that's really cool. If I point to that, mommy does a flip and I get a cookie, you know? So it's really important to have that power. And then, of course, secondary, after we've learned some of these basic communication skills, then we go to yes and no. Okay? So teaching yes and no before we really have another way to communicate doesn't really make a lot of sense because yes and no is a higher level type skill um, along with increasing child initiated requests going back to those communication, communication temptations presenting the child with an opportunity and then getting them to initiate um, the more spontaneous type of um, initiations we put into our training and into our teaching I think they generalize much better if we teach everything very rotely it's harder for kids to maintain them. But if we try to put more naturalistic things that are in their environment into their sessions, I think it generalizes and it holds much better. Going to receptive language, we want to make sure that children understand object labels. So understanding um, different object names and that objects have names. Before you can teach actions, we need to understand objects. And then once we have actions and objects, then going to body parts and those different functions. So it's really just taking a developmental framework and teaching things in a more consistent order. Um, I know that two-year-olds know their body parts, and all mommy, you know, moms and dads want to touch your nose, touch your eyes, but that's a harder task than actually picking up a cup when I say pick up the cup if that makes sense, because the cup is not abstract. It's there, it's concrete, it's real. And that's going to be an easier task to teach than touch your nose, because I can't see my nose unless I'm in front of a mirror. Okay, but just something to think about when you're developing goals. Um, expressive language, and this can be very challenging because there's different reasons why kids are not speaking. Um, 
Some children very young will have those early signs of apraxia. They have some oral motor challenges that are preventing them from actually using words. There are some kids that actually have severe processing difficulties that are preventing them from using verbal language. So very early on, if we take our foundational skills, we look at imitation, we want to look at verbal imitation. Can we get Johnny to imitate sounds on command? Um, if he's making a lot of sounds, um, we want to do verbal stimulation, and we want to, you know, reinforce that, you know, make those sounds back to him so that he starts modeling and generalizing those use of sounds. So ex with the expressive language, once we have sound production, we can work on labeling objects, and we can work on identifying actions. But again, it's a progression. We need to have that first step where kids start saying words. Okay, I have this little video clip. This is a little guy who, um, pretty severely apraxic. He's two years old in this video, and he absolutely dies and loves letters. So this is a speech therapist actually working with him to get him to do some verbal imitation. And hopefully I can play this. Wait a minute, let me go back. There's no sound, right? Oh, man. Okay, sorry about that. Well, there was sound. Anyway, <laughs> in this particular case, she has the letters and he wants to do the puzzle. And he really, really tries to make the sounds because he wants that puzzle so bad. So it's a very highly motivating activity and she's able to get him to change and shape the sound using this system because it is so motivating. There's no technicians in here, is there? No? Okay. Well, I'm sorry. I apologize. I had earlier issues, but um, you can watch him. He's really cute. If you watch his faces, though, with each letter, you can see how he's really trying to make the sound. And she's not giving him the letter until he makes some kind of an attempt. But again, another child you may not be able to get to sit in this kind of a setting or sit with this kind of an activity, but this is highly motivating for this young man. Okay. Right, let me go to the next one. Okay. Sorry. The next section that um, I think we look at, and maybe this is more for speech pathologists, but we also look at oral motor and feeding. Uh, making sure that if a child is having challenges with feeding, we look at how that, their oral musculature and that oral motor area is functioning. Um, so we're going to look at chewing. We're going to look at using a cup and being able to drink. A lot of our little ones have these significant issues very early on. And actually I'm finding more and more little kids in early intervention are having troubles with feeding, chewing, being able to take in liquids. So if we start working on that early, that's going to help the entire verbal piece, strengthening the oral motor area. And of course, tasting. Um, I don't know how many of you have children that have difficulties taking new foods. So if we start introducing new foods and new textures very early on, we're going to be more successful long term in introducing foods later. And then the last area that we're going to talk about is um, play and social skills. Um, those early primary play skills that we want to look at are fine motor play. Can the child actually take toys and use them appropriately? And are they reinforced by the toys? Along with that, we teach isolate toy play. And isolate toy play is a very specific skill where we're teaching the child to play by themselves. Um, many times in early intervention, I think in general, we play with kids, we engage them, we give them information, and it's that real interactive play where I don't know how many times moms have said, I wish I could make dinner and he could play with a toy so I don't have to put on a video. Okay, so we're going to sit on the floor and we're going to say, Johnny, play, and then we're going to prompt him to play with the toy so that he learns how to do it on his own without that constant prompting. Um, along with that turn-taking, being able to take turns with an activity, 
Those are those primary skills. And then the secondary piece is being able to gain an adult's attention, um, not necessarily through crying, you know, being able to tap mommy on the shoulder or somehow go over and get mom's attention without screaming or crying, um, being able to do symbolic toy play, and, of course, learning how to wait. So these are those secondary skills that we want to teach as well, the primary being that early play, and then moving on to more advanced play-type skills later on. Oh, I'm sorry, I had one more. And the last area is self-care. Um, so self-care skills, again, not forgetting that two-year-olds need to use a cup. Two-year-olds need to use utensils. And two-year-olds actually start dressing. So maybe it's not about pulling on their pants, but when we're doing toilet training, we need to be able to take down our pants. Um, toilet training readiness is another area that I know a lot of families and professionals are interested in, but preparing that child for toilet training. Um, a lot of little ones are very afraid of the bathroom. So starting to practice going into the bathroom and getting used to that, because that's a transition, it's a change, and it's a difference. And those types of things are very difficult for our kids. So when you're developing programs and when you're using a specific curriculum, making sure that you take goals and activities from all those developmental areas and making sure that you have a comprehensive program prepared for that child to make sure that it's all about the, the entire child, not just their head um, and not just their hands. So making sure that we're able to do that. And hopefully today this presentation has given you some ideas and some ways to use ABA strategies and just to think about how you're going to developmentally put together programs. And that's it. So thank you very, very much. If you have any questions, I'm here.